All right, well, let's take a look at some announcements before we get into our third and final gradually varying flow prediction method. Homework 13 is due on Monday, and then on Friday we won't have class, but I'll still get a homework assignment out of you. Uh, you know, we remember cramming that under my door before 5 o'clock on Friday so that the instant I land, I can rush from the airport and pick them up out of my office and uh, start the grading. Uh, final exam for this class is scheduled Tuesday, May 7th, and if any of you prefer to take that final exam on Friday, let me know. I think we're going to just have a full-fledged uh, switcheroo on our hands, to, to use a technical term. So, whichever you prefer, let me know and so I can get a count on how many students will be taking it. We're going to be learning the standard step method today, and uh, it's an approach that complements the numerical integration method and the step-by-step, -step, or direct step methods that we've already learned. Um, in the last lecture, when we learned the direct step method, what we realized is that it's only for a channel where the cross-sectional shape isn't changing. And so, in other words, it has to be both rectangular upstream and downstream, or trapezoidal upstream or downstream, or a half circle. The shape of the channel, its width, is constant at each of the sections. Um, sometimes that's the case, but in other cases, uh, we have to have a different method because the channel geometry is changing in the direction of flow. And so this standard step method that we're going to be learning today can be used regardless of the cross-sectional shape, but it's iterative, meaning we're going to set up a spreadsheet where there's multiple rows, and each row, rather than being uh, multiple sections, each row will just be between a single uh, section. So in other words, we're going to have to do an iteration just to go one step. Whereas last time when we were working the step-by-step uh, -step method, we had multiple rows, but that's because we had multiple steps. And so we were coming to some solution in each row. In this case, we're going to take multiple rows to come to one solution for just a, uh, a single step. Now, there is a change in the definitions where previously uh, one and two has meant upstream and downstream respectively. Here in the standard step method, 1 and 2 mean something different. And so we're changing the rules on a little bit. Right? In the context of just this method, 1 means known and 2 means the unknown location. And sometimes what we know is upstream, sometimes what we know is downstream. Uh, the same suggestion will be in force as previously in these other water surface profile methods. We've said that if we have subcritical flow, then we should work upstream, or if we have supercritical flow, we should work downstream. But the main thing I want to emphasize for standard step method is that location one is applied where you know the depth, and location two is what you're trying to solve for. It's the, the location where the depth is not known. And so in a diagram like this, we get an idea of some of these definitions. What we're going to be measuring in this pictured example, we have subcritical flow. And so one is downstream. And ordinarily, when we're numbering sections, one is upstream and two is downstream. So the reason why we're saying that one is here in the downstream position is because we happen to know the depth right here. And we know how high the channel bottom is off the, up above the datum. We have some horizontal datum that we're going to be measuring elevations against. We know the uh, velocity head. We know the head loss at that point. And so location one is where we know things. And location two is that section that we don't know the flow depth. And the whole reason we're applying the standard step method, remember, is that between one and two, something's changing about the channel. It's getting wider. It's getting narrower. It's going from a rectangle to a trapezoid. Something's changing about the channel geometry, so we're not able to use either of the other two methods. Any questions so far about how the standard step method is different from direct step or numerical integration? 
All right, so it's a red alert. Keep in mind that uh, one and two mean different things here in the standard step method than they do in uh, most of the other applications of hydraulics where we uh, work from upstream to downstream with our numbering. Um, in the direct step method, we were looking at specific energy. Um, the, e, the, the E, the capital E we solved in our example, that was specific energy, meaning that um, we were balancing the energy above the channel bottom. In the, uh, direct, I'm sorry, in the standard step method, this is a total energy balance approach. And so we are looking at uh, Z here. We're not just measuring energy above the channel bottom, but this water surface, WS, is some elevation of the water surface above the horizontal datum. And so um, uh, the horizontal line that is our vertical datum. Um, so you'll notice that the WS2 is the depth Y2 and then Z2, which is the elevation above the datum to the channel bottom. So this is a total energy balance method. So here's the method, and uh, a bulleted list like this, of course, doesn't make a lot of sense until you have uh, the application also uh, going forward. And so what we'll do in the order that we do it is, first of all, we're not going to know what the depth is at the unknown location. But we can make a guess based on what kind of a water surface profile we have. You know, at the, uh, uh, at the location where we do know something, you know, at one, we know the critical depth. We probably know the normal depth. We know the, the actual flow depth. And so we know those three depths at our known location to be able to say if it's an M1 or an S2 or whatever the case may be so that we can guess on whether it's deeper or shallower at two. And so we'll make some initial guess and maybe we'll start off with WS1, but we'll increase it or decrease it from there based on what the water surface profile type told us about uh, the shape of the curve. All right. So with some assumed value for how, how uh, high it is from the datum up to the water depth, then we'll calculate the observed head loss. And so the observed head loss, based on that guess value, is simply going to be the, uh, the energy at 2 minus the energy at 1. So that will be specific energy. Um, then we're going to calculate, based on all the assumptions so far, um, what the head loss will be based on the slope of the energy grade line. So Manning's equation, S of F, we will apply at the midpoint you know, based on the, uh, the guess of how deep the water is there. We'll calculate what's going on at the midpoint, you know, what is the shape, what is the area, what is the hydraulic radius at the midpoint so that we can find out the uh, slope of the energy grade line, S of F bar at the midpoint. And then with the uh, head loss calculated formula there, it also takes into account uh, any kind of energy loss in the transition. Because remember that if a channel goes from a rectangle to a trapezoid, there's going to be some sort of turbulence that gets induced because of the shape of the channel changing. And so this C value is a coefficient that we've talked about before in a previous lecture when we had channel shapes changing. And so it's related to um, it's the analogy of a local loss. Local loss is because of some sort of a change in shape or a change in direction, a localized disturbance. And so we'll apply that C value and account for how much head loss is, uh, how much loss there is between the two points. So now we, we have two different ways of looking at the head loss. The observed head loss that's based on our assumed depth at 2, and this calculated head loss that's based on Manning's equation applied at the midpoint. And we have to compare the two, and if they don't match, then that tells us that our guess for WS2 isn't right. So we need to update WS2 uh, based on... Um, the calculated head loss. And so we'll find some average value, update the guess for the water surface depth at 2, and then go through the whole process over again. So 
Obviously, a set of instructions like that doesn't make any sense until we have an example to apply them against. And so this is the example that's in your notes. Um, it's in the slides and then on the final page of the, uh, of the handouts is a spreadsheet template. And I've already told you my whole philosophy on these spreadsheet templates, how it's like a, uh, I've got mixed feelings about doing it. Because on the one hand, it may give you the idea that there's only one way to solve this and that the column order is somehow magical, uh, but that's not true. You could figure out some other way of ordering the columns and it would work out just fine, the method would. But what I'd like you to do is take a few moments to set up the spreadsheet to have the same column titles that are listed in the handout that I've given you there. And then we'll work through this example together and then save your spreadsheet because on Friday we'll do uh, another in-class exercise where you're applying an existing spreadsheet to try and solve a, a new shape, a new set of shapes. So for the next couple of minutes I'll just give you time to uh, type in those column titles. Okay, so Section one is uh, is downstream, and the flow depth there is five feet. From trapezoidal to rectangular. Section two is upstream, and it is rectangular. So here at section one, the reason why I'm going through to classify the water surface profile at one is so that we can know for our initial guess if we should guess that the water depth is deeper or shallower at section two. So downstream it's a trapezoid, upstream is a rectangle. And so what's shown on the board there is uh, first of all finding the slope of the channel. And we find that the slope of the channel is related to the invert and how far apart the two sections are. And section one has an invert of five feet that's five feet above the datum. Section two has an invert of seven feet, so the difference is that the section two is two feet higher than section one, and it's a thousand feet upstream, so that gives us a slope of 0.2 percent. And that's the slope that goes into Manning's equation when we're finding the normal depth. And it's been a while since we saw anything with traditional units, so remember that Manning's equation has this 1.49 prefix that uh, accounts for the units and the uh, the shape of this being trapezoidal means that the area is 25 times y so 25 is the channel bottom width y being the depth and that gives us the rectangular component of the trapezoid and then 2y squared is the sum of the two edge pieces and so uh, if it is y deep then it will be um, 2y across the top, and so uh, that gives us the area, the wetted perimeter, since it is a uh, two horizontal, one vertical slope on the sides, we can get 2.236y is the length of the side slope, and there are two side slopes, and so that's where the wetted perimeter of uh, 25 plus 4.472y comes from. It comes from the channel bottom and the side slope, both of them on either side. So solving for the normal depth gives us a normal depth of 6.848 feet. So we know that the actual flow depth is 5 feet. The normal depth is 6.848 feet. What we need finally is the critical depth. And we can't use the traditional uh, lowercase q squared divided by g to the one-third power because that's only applicable to a rectangular channel. So we have to use the full equation for the Froude number there and solve for depth, solve for y. And that's, you know, this isn't going away. Although we don't do it often, just be, for the sake of time, we ordinarily have been teaching a lot of things using rectangular channels. Um, it's important to be able to calculate the critical depth using the full Froude number equation and not having to use the uh, simplified approach for a rectangular channel. So top width is going to be a function of how deep it is. 
So the top width will be 25 plus 4 times the depth. However deep it is, y, remember there's 2y on either side of the trapezoid. So together that's 4y. And then the, uh, the area, 25y plus 2y squared. So all of that together, solving for the critical depth, 3.346. So the normal depth is greater than the critical depth, which means it's a mild slope. And since 5 is between the normal depth and the critical depth, that gives us uh, zone 2. So this is an M2 profile. And characteristic of an M2 profile is that in, when you go upstream, the water is deeper upstream. And so what we would guess is the water depth is 5 feet above the channel bottom here. Uh, it might be deeper than that upstream particularly since we're losing all the flow area on the sides. Okay? So let's transition over to the spreadsheet part of this problem now. <clears throat> okay, um, I put the formulas onto my spreadsheet just to make it easier to refer to each of these columns that are going to be calculated. Um, we have a bunch of things, uh, a bunch of these columns related to the known section at one and that's not ever going to change what we know about one. And so the flow depth at one is defined as five feet and the water surface, the definition of water surface is it's the elevation above the datum plus the water depth itself. And so the water surface is 5 plus the 5, the flow depth. So 5 was how high the invert elevation, and then five, the other 5 is the depth. Okay, this is the trapezoidal section, and so we've already seen the formula for the area is um, 25 times y plus 2 times y squared. Okay. So an area of 175 square feet, the velocity is going to be the flow rate divided by the area. And the velocity head will be velocity squared divided by 2g. Oh, I almost did 9.81. Remember g is 32.2. And also remember that I'm recording this demo, so if a certain step I went through too quickly, uh, don't worry, you'll be able to go back and uh, access this recording on YouTube if you need help setting up the spreadsheet a little bit later. All right, wetted perimeter is 25, which is the channel bottom, plus 4.472 times Y. So that gives us the wetted perimeter. Hydraulic radius, of course, is area divided by wetted perimeter. Right. Yep. Area divided by wetted perimeter. All right. And now E is simply going to be <coughs> the flow depth. plus the velocity head, well, plus the uh, elevation above the invert. So what I really ought to say is it's WS plus the velocity head. Okay. Now, S sub F, I'm going to use Manning's equation to find the slope of the energy grade line at this known location 1. And so Manning's equation solving for the slope is N times Q divided by 1.49, remember these are traditional units, times the area times the hydraulic radius to the two-thirds power. And all of that is squared. So S sub F1 is talking about what's the slope of the energy grade line at location 1. 
Now, I know I'm going to have several iterations, and so I'm just going to drag this down a little bit. Uh, somewhere along the line, I didn't anchor something that I ought to have, so let me just... Oh, it's because it's giving a... It's Okay, this is always going to be 5 here. All right. It's going to be constant. Nothing's changing. The... Um, All right. If we need to do more, we'll do it. We'll drag it down a little more. Okay. The real meat of what's going on is with the the unknown section. So we don't really know what the flow depth upstream is, other than it should be deeper. And our our depth at one was five. So I'm going to say 5.1, just as a first guess of what the depth is there. Okay. Now remember the definition of WS is y plus delta z. So our delta z here is 7 feet. So equals 7 plus y2. All right, the area to, this is a rectangular, so the area is just going to be the channel width of 25 times the depth. So 25 times the flow depth there. The velocity will be Q divided by A, anchoring Q divided by A. Let me zoom out and see if anybody has questions so far on any of the columns that we've calculated till now. Manning's equation with uh, traditional units. Any other questions? All right. Okay, so velocity head is simply V squared divided by 2 G. Wetted perimeter for a rectangular channel is just the 25 foot wide plus 2 times the depth. Hydraulic radius is area divided by wetted perimeter. E, total energy, is the water surface plus the velocity head. And then S of F2 is applying Manning's equation at section 2. So that is going to be N anchored times Q anchored divided by 1.49 times the area. times the hydraulic radius to the two-thirds power. Okay, so the observed head loss that it's talking about in this next column, you can see up here through the formula of observed head loss, E2 minus E1. Okay, so equals E2 minus E1. So this is based on if the, you know, this guess value of what the depth is. If the depth was 5.1 up at section 2, then our obs observed head loss would be 2.55 feet. SF bar is just the. Excuse me. Ask you a All right. All right. Um, SF bar is simply going to be the average of the two energy grade lines slopes that we found so far. So it is 
this s of f plus that one divided by 2. And now the calculated head loss based on the formula that's right here. Let me drag this down so we can see it as we type it in. Okay. So head loss calculated will be the average S sub F bar times the length. The length is a thousand feet between these two sections. Plus C coefficient of contraction times the absolute value of the velocity head at 2 minus the velocity head at 1. So that's the calculated head loss. Now based on that, the calculated head loss, we're going to come up with the WS2 calculated. So now this is the formula that we're going to use to fill in this column. So WS2 calculated is WS1, 10 feet, plus the velocity head at 1, plus the head loss calculated, minus the velocity head at 2. So it's interesting now. We've got some calculated. This is what the water surface at 2 should be at, 19.1 feet. But our earlier guess said that it was at 12.1. So the fact that these don't match, that WS2 over here, based on our initial guess, and this calculated WS2, since they don't match, there has to be an updated value. And so for the updated, what we do is we come up with a better guess of what the water surface depth is at location 2, and it will just use the average. And so we've got this one and our earlier guess of water surface at 2 and we divide it by 2. So we, we take the, the midpoint between them. And this percent difference is uh, how different is the updated and the calculated uh, guess that we came up with. And this will help us to know if we've converged. So equals um, uh, this minus that divided by that. If we change that as a percent, we're about 22% different. So that tells us we haven't converged yet. Okay, well thankfully it's a lot easier once we uh, get into subsequent rows. Instead of just coming up with some random new guess for what the new assumed value of y2 should be, what we can use is this. We'll use the updated value of the water surface from here minus z2. z2 is 7 feet. That's how high above the datum the invert at 2 is. So minus 7. So we've got some initial guess that's going to be hopefully closer to reality. And all the rest of these are just based on the previously calculated formula. So we can actually drag everything else down. And we're a lot closer this time. 2.6% error between the calculated water surface and the updated water surface. And so we do that again. And our guess changes slightly. We can drag these down again. 0.8% different. So we can just keep repeating it over and over. And at this point, it's essentially converged. What we're finding is that the calculated water surface is 15.04, the updated 15.05. Um, maybe we'll do it just one more. 
to see how much of a change we get in this final step. So you can see that the water surface depth has converged and so the actual flow depth above the channel bottom is 8.05 feet. So if we look back at the diagram, the depth at 2 is 8.05 feet. Now that would change based on this uh, coefficient C that accounts for energy losses due to the change in shape. It would be different if we had a different channel roughness, uh, different flow rate. Any one of these parameters being different would alter the flow depth at 2. What this has allowed us to do is both simultaneously take into account that the shape is changing and that we have gradually varying flow and that the, uh, that the water depth is going to be changing as we go upstream because of the gradually varying flow. That's right. Water surface and velocity head. I don't either. Uh, yeah, everything else is the same? Yeah, everything hmm. oh, no, Okay. Well, we're going to continue our exposure to the standard step method in class on Friday. So save your spreadsheet, even if you're not done with it. I'm going to have another example problem for you to try out in class and my hope is that the homework will really be a breeze for you. After we've had a couple of these detailed in-class exercises, you'll have your own spreadsheet for all three of the methods ready to remind you of how to solve the, the homework problems that you've got. So I'll see you in class on Friday.